Hello and welcome to tonight's session from Get PR Done. Uh, tonight, Alan Story will be talking to Ria Laverne, former president of Fair Vote Canada, about the lessons that campaigners in the UK can learn on the campaign for fair votes from our friends over the water. Uh, we're also delighted to be joined by Liberal Democrat President Mark Pack, who has uh, generously offered to be first responder to the interview. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, what I'd like to do is to hand over the floor to uh, Get PR Done co-founder, Alan Story, uh, to kick off the session. Alan. Thank you there, Steve. Most appreciated. All right. Just before we get into Rael's main talk, our main interview, um, I just want to give people sort of 90 seconds on Canada. Uh, it's more than just the Mounties, more than just frozen tundra, etc. cetera. Um, and just to tell you a few facts about Canada uh, to help you get some context to what Raoul's gonna say, and he's also gonna get into it more. So I haven't been there since 1992. I'm probably a bit behind things. August spoke for a little bit and Raoul can fill in the blanks. Okay. Canada is a very large country. Um, but it's only got 35, it's the second largest in the world, um, but it's only got a population only of, of 35 million. So it's about half the, the population of the UK. There is, um, it, it was a former British colony. That's quite important for the voting system they have there. We'll get to that later. Um, there are 10 provinces and three territories. And this is a huge difference between the United Kingdom and Canada. Canada is a confederation. And the provinces are really important. I mean, they're in charge of health care and education and big, big areas like that. Of course, there's some national coordination, but you know, if they don't want to do X, they, they want to textbooks in, in Newfoundland about something, it's all up to local provinces. Each one of those provinces, of course, also has their own elections, which is pretty important. Or which could they could maybe even get PR. There's two official languages in Canada, French and English. There's also the indigenous people. It's Canada's shame the way they treated indigenous people. There's many immigrants in the country. Um, there are two pretty centrist parties in Canada. One is a liberal party, and the other is a conservative party. And that, of course, follows a pattern. Of, of first past the post, the electoral duopoly. Now, there, because Canada is a big country, uh, well, it's not the only reason, because also because it's multilingual or you know, bilingual, there's also can be the creation of regional parties, somewhat like the SNP in this country. So there is the Bloc Québécois in the Quebec province. Um, and um, there is also, uh, the New Democratic Party, which is somewhat like the Labour Party, it's uh, you know a, a social democratic party. There's the Green Party. There's some other smaller parties. Um, and let's see now. Uh, there's a House of Commons, which has got 338 members. They you know like our House of Commons. They have instead of a House of Lords, they have a Senate, all appointed. And um, then our main point is that in fact they also have first past the post, which is a colonial import from Britain. Canada was a colony, became an independent country in um, 19, sorry, 1867, and in 1931 became fully independent. So it's still a pretty young country. Um, so that's, well, what have I missed out in terms of, of uh, 10 fast points on Canada? I think you've done a better job than I could have. Thank you, that's great. I was a journalist. Okay, well then let's get right into it. I just want to, the main part of the interview is not going to be about Fair Vote Canada, uh, but I think people should know a little bit about Fair Vote Canada, how you're organized, the number of members, the aims, and then we can get into the question of what makes Canada an interesting case for PR, electoral reform, uh, and what are the lessons you've learned in Fair Vote Canada for campaigning in that terrain. So tell us a little about your group. You're the okay, former, yeah, the, you're the past president, so. Yep, 
Yeah, so Fairville Canada was created in 2001, so a little over 20 years ago. Uh, it, it arose at a very interesting time in terms of uh, electoral uh, issues in Canada because they, we'd had some outrageous uh, electoral results in several of the provinces at that time. Uh, there had already been some studies, and, and it was just a subject that was being discussed a lot at that time. So it, it arose at a very opportune time. Um, it's not the only organization that deals with proportional representation in Canada. That, that is certainly our exclusive mandate is to advocate for uh, proportional representation. Uh, other organizations, we have... An, uh, sorry, I'm, I got a, a, a little brain freeze there. Um, Unlock Democracy uh, exists in Canada as well. And then at the provincial level, there are separate organizations in Pr Prince Edward Island, British Columbia, and Quebec. So we're not, we're not alone, uh, but we are certainly the primary organization that deals with uh, proportional representation in Canada. We have a mailing list of about 40,000 people. Um, so those are the people who receive our newsletters on a fairly regular basis and that we will tap for volunteers. Uh, when we have particular campaigns on the go. Um, and we have about 2,500 members, uh, so dues paying members, so to speak. Um, so these are the people who will actually vote in our, our board uh, when we have elections and, and that kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of the basics with regards to uh, Fairboat Canada. Why is Canada an interesting country in terms of uh, electoral reform? I'd say what you said at the beginning, Alan, uh, about the diversity of Canada, the fact that it's a federation, what it means is that we can have campaigns going on proportional representation probably most of the time in Canada. <laughs> uh, it's live somewhere just about all the time. And it, it, it means being like president of Fairville Canada or anything like that. Uh, can be a very busy, uh, busy occupation. So each of the, you know, several of the provinces have had proportional representation uh, movements, some of them more than others. The, the big players are Ontario, BC, Quebec, Prince Edward Island. There's been things happening elsewhere as well, but those are the really big ones. Um, and then, of course, we've got the federal scene as well. And there's been some work also at the municipal scene. So with all those combined, uh, you've got things going uh, pretty much all the time. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, people in Canada are fairly aware of the issues, uh, you know, the concept of false majorities, the concept of wasted votes, uh, vote splitting, obviously, that's not a hard one to appreciate, uh, strategic voting, all of those things are fairly familiar uh, concepts. So we've been at it for a while. Um, in terms of lessons learned, um, I've looked quite a bit at our history in Canada. It, you know, I didn't just focus on the years that, that I was president, but also looked back quite a bit. Um, the, uh, the movement to get proportional representation in Canada, just like pretty much everywhere else, goes back to the early 20th century. So over 100 years. Um, I would say that the, the model, the implicit model of change that everyone has had in mind is the one that was established in Europe very early on, which was, well, one or two of the parties decide that electoral reform is needed, they promise it, they get elected, and they bring it in. So that's the promise and deliver model of electoral change, I would say. Um, I would say in Canada, the model has been more like promise and betrayal. So if you, if you want a slogan, that's our slogan for Canada is promise and betrayal. Uh, and that goes back 100 years. It starts at the federal level with uh, Mackenzie King, who had promised to bring in a, a single transferable vote if he elected in 2019. Uh, when the Liberals did get elected in 2021, they uh, started to be less enthusiastic about proportional representation because, well, they'd been elected under first past the post. And if politicians want to be reelected, whether as a party or as individual politicians, uh, changing the system is often the last thing that they'd want to do. So we get to the betrayal part of, uh, of this story. And that was the first uh, really uh, poignant example of that was under Mackenzie King at the federal level. And the most recent one at the federal level that I'm sure even in the UK people know about that was the betrayal by Justin Trudeau, who had promised that 2015, and this is very categorical, 
2015 will be the last first past the post election. He repeated that hundreds of times uh, in his electoral campaign and afterwards, and then uh, rather cynically just uh, broke that promise and, and, and didn't deliver on it. The other very interesting, so that's the federal case. The other very interesting example of uh, promise and betrayal is in Quebec. And the case of Quebec is interesting because there are four parties. I hope I haven't missed any, but I believe there are four parties that have ever held power, starting with the Conservatives back when, uh, the Liberals, the Parti Québécois, and most recently, the Coalition Avenir Québec. So those four parties that have held power, all of them at one time or another promised to bring in electoral reform. All of them, once they were elected with a false majority of their own, either forgot like the conservatives, they, they never formally promised, but they had it in the books, they had it in the policy books, or uh, dragged their feet, uh, or just simply didn't deliver. And the, the, the closest we ever got was with the very recent uh, Coalition Avenir Quebec, which was elected in 2018. They actually drafted a bill and got through the two first readings. Um, then COVID hit and that gave them an excuse to, to renege uh, in turn and they have now, it looks like, completely abandoned that project. So in the case of Quebec, we have four parties, all of which have gone through the same process. So what that tells you is that this is a model that may have worked for Europe in the early 20th century because of the particular historical context, uh, but in the Canadian context today, this is a model that uh, has proven itself not to work uh, time and time again. Um, the closest we get to anything else is where people don't promise anything at all. They just ignore the issue. That's another way of doing things. Or you can do like they did in BC in 2017 and promise a referendum. Then you have the referendum, the referendum fails. The result is the same. You don't get any change. So what we need is we need a new strategy, a new approach, a different way of trying to get from A to B in terms of electoral reform in Canada. That's of course uh, rings true in this country as well. We remember in uh, the election of 1997, Tony Blair in the manifesto promised a referendum on uh, electoral reform. But of course, then when they won a huge majority, they somehow forgot about that promise. So there's, and you know, we spent a lot of time in Get PR Done trying to win over the Labour Party to PR. Uh, we're not there yet. But even if we got there, there's no, um, Keir Stammer is not, the leader of the, the Labour Party has not come out for PR. There's no question that in fact, if Labour through some kind of thing got into some kind of government that they might in fact try and betray us again, have, you know, pull a Justin Trudeau. So it's, it really sort of runs out very interestingly in this country. Um, and I just also just wanna add, you talked about, you know, you're a mature organization, you know, I mean, all these chapters and all this kind of stuff. I just find it very interesting. It was something Rael told uh, Steve and I a couple of weeks ago, Fair Vote Canada has only a single employee. I know she's brilliant, Anita, but it's really kind of quite interesting that you have that. Okay, so this idea of electing your friends, elect the people who promise hasn't worked out very well. Well, one alternative then would be, you mentioned referendums. Some say we need a referendum to give legitimacy to PR. Uh, unless we have the referendum, you know, then in fact, uh, you really can't bring this in. Well, should um, electoral reformers uh, support the calling of referendums? What has been your experience in Canada? Well, our, our experience in Canada has been rather disastrous when it comes to uh, to referendums. I, I guess, you know, you make a really, really good point that legitimacy is required. Uh, the old model has failed because politicians once elected are in a flagrant conflict of interest because the system that elected them is the first past the post, it's the status quo. So th there is a theory out there that's been raised by one of our MPs, Scott Reed. He's an MP with the Conservatives, and, and he would advocate for referendums, if nothing else, as a way to get change that politicians will not bring in on their own. And I would say in New Zealand, that's more or less what happened. I don't think that either national or uh, labor in uh, New Zealand would have brought in proportional representation without a referendum. 
You have examples also in the United States where they will run citizens initiatives to change the voting system, voting system at least at the margins, bringing in ranked ballots or things like that. So it's not like it's inconceivable as an idea. It's in the actual practice of referendums uh, that you run into problems because of the way they're implemented, but also because of the way voters themselves behave. You wanna start with how voters behave. There's just a limit to how much people are prepared to invest to understand a complex issue like electoral reform. And I think that's just a basic uh, barrier to using referendums at all as a way, uh, a way of doing things. But if you look in detail at how referendums have been done in Canada, first of all, we've had seven of them since 2005. So we know what we speak of when it comes to referendums. And here in, in the UK, you've had one in 2011, the one on the, the alternative vote. Uh, but when you look at the different features of those referendums, you quickly understand why they have failed. So first of all, a very high threshold hold most of the time, usually 60% of the vote. Nobody ever brought in first past the post with a 60% of the vote, <laughs> but for changing it, you need to have 60% apparently. So that's made it extremely difficult. Uh, to achieve 60% is, is almost impossible. So that's the first thing. Secondly, public education has been very limited in the sense that the people who are responsible for doing public education for the government side, uh, the elections officer usually, uh, they seem to think that the way to be neutral about presenting the information, the way to be fair is to focus on how it works and not on why the issue matters. And of course, why the issue matters is what matters to the electorate. So they end up not having the, the information that they need. Uh, secondly, the way it's organized. Thirdly, it's organized as a pro and a con side and uh, funded by with public money. And then it becomes up to the pro and the con sides to actually do this education about why it matters. Uh, but on this, the, the con side has a tremendous advantage. And uh, in terms of, uh, because it's, it's citizens themselves don't know the alternative, they know first past the post. So it's a devil you know versus the devil you don't know kind of, kind of thing, creating a tremendous burden on the pro side to do all the education. Whereas all the no side has to do is so misinformation and fear mongering uh, in order to defeat, uh, to defeat the referendum, which is what, what tends to happen. And then even if you do win, you lose anyway. <laughs> That's the final trick the politicians have up their sleeves. Uh, having the high threshold is one way to do that. The, the, BC, the first BC referendum in 2005 actually won in a sense with 57.7% of the vote. That's pretty darn good, but the threshold was set at 60. And then the 2016 plebiscite in uh, Prince Edward Island, which won with over 50%, which is all that they needed. Politicians simply said, well, the turnout wasn't high enough. So even when you win, you lose. Um, so it hasn't been a, a very happy uh, experience in the Canadian case. Um, and we tend to see it as really a maneuver by those who oppose change uh, in order to make sure that, uh, that we don't get uh, electoral reform. I'll just stop there and let you ask a question. Okay, okay. Um, bore people. Well, I'm just going to ask you this question um, uh, about the importance of representative democracy, you know, uh, legislators as opposed to a referendum. And this is the kind of government we have is we elect people, yeah. you know, yeah. they, they take us to war, they do all kinds of things without calling a referendum. Um, does this reinforce this idea when it comes to PR? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, I, I mean, do they, see a difference. The legislatures when, or some other body which can make, you know, do all kinds of things. Yeah. Why can't they change the voting system? Well, I think what's different about changing the voting system is that politicians are, in fact, in a conflict of interest. So whatever they do, they would need to have it legitimized in some way. The referendum is one approach. Based on our experience, it's not the best approach. So really what you need to do is you need to find some approach to legitimize the process. You need to find some approach whereby politicians can in some sense recuse themselves on the grounds that they're in a conflict of interest. We ask politicians to do that all the time. If you have a financial conflict of interest, you're expected not to participate in that decision making. The same thing applies when it comes to electoral reform in my view. Right. So you need you need you need some sort of process. Right. It's just a referendum is not the best. 
Okay, so, and thanks for the Canadians here are chirping in with all their comments, most appreciated. Um, and you can certainly add, you know, after um, uh, we go through the formal things, yeah, jump in. Um, so referendums are not the way to get PR, what is? Like, how do you look at, how do we change things from this first past the post, winner takes all mentality to a, um, a, a, you know, a, co a collegial, a cooperative model that we, you know, we can work together. Um, and I understand your Fair Votes Canada is proponents of citizens' assemblies. Um, uh, what have been the experiences with citizens' assemblies in Canada? Uh, well, we've had two. Uh, we had a specifically on electoral reform, we've had citizens assemblies on, on other topics, but the ones we look at the most carefully, of course, are the two that we've had uh, with regards to electoral reform. So one was in British Columbia prior to the referendum there. And people think that one of the reasons that that, that first referendum did so well is because there was a lot of respect for the citizens assembly process that led to it. So process is really important in all of this. Um, we had a citizens assembly also in Ontario in 2007, um, but it wasn't publicized to the same degree. And it was a little bit more rushed as processes go. It was brought in quite late in the process, uh, shortly before another election. And then it was done at the same time as the next election, but it was really quite rushed. Um, the result in that case were, were, not, as, uh, were not as high. Um, but maybe just to back up a little bit, what we have then is the old model of promise and deliver or promise and betrayal. And we're looking to replace that with something else. The question then is, what would that look like? And yes, a citizen's assembly is fundamental to it, but in terms of process, it can, we can take a further step back and say, the first thing that has to be done is to negotiate an agreement among the parties to respect a certain process. In other words, legitimize the process. And rather than asking politicians to promise PR if they're elected, ask them to promise a citizen's assembly if they're elected, and ideally get more than one party to promise a citizen's assembly. So that, that, that's the idea there. Um, and then to get into a little bit more details with regards to what politicians are agreeing to, uh, first thing to agree to, we want them to acknowledge that they're in a conflict of interest. We want them, them to acknowledge that there are problems with the existing system. That should be part of any agreement uh, up front. Um, we want them to at least start a discussion of what sorts of democratic principles electoral reform should be based on. Principles of fairness, of simplicity, of effective representation, and what sort of governance are we looking at? By changing the electoral system, you're gonna change the type of governance, we know that. So can we agree on what we'd be looking for in terms of improved governments? Greater attention to long-term issues, for example, a more collegial approach, you mentioned that, uh, Alan. So that the discussion of about what parties and politicians can agree to even before an election, involves a number of dimensions. And the last element of that would be, if they've already agreed that they're in a conflict of interest, what kind of solution can we put in place that makes more sense in terms of handing this over to citizens? Since a referendum doesn't seem to work that well, what, it would, what would it look like? I think it would definitely look uh, as a, it would look like a citizens assembly of one sort. It might have a citizens assembly combined with some sort of expert independent group, uh, but the normal solution, the normal approach is usually just a straight uh, citizens assembly with enough resources, uh, with enough time, uh, it's gotta be independent. And then we talk about what the mandate should be, uh, that can get uh, quite interesting as well. It's gotta be done right. Right. So that's so, what I'm, I'm looking for is a, a, an agreement. Right. I find that very interesting, Well. In the PR movement in this country, we've never used the word conflict of interest. But of course, that's exactly what it is. MPs in safe seats who have sat there for 30 years, we could rhyme them off. They've got a conflict of interest, but it's sort of their pension versus, versus democracy. And um, 
I think it's really, I, I've already written a blog in my head about conflict of interest. It's a, it's a concept that has not come up at all in the PR movement. I mean, it's sort of implied, but really direct, like you guys, you're not the ones to decide because you have a certain vested interest in maintaining the status quo. So is the Citizens Assembly then at the center of Fair Vote Canada, Fair Vote Canada, sorry, uh, your strategy for change? Yes, it is definitely the central pillar right now of the strategy for change as it has evolved uh, ever since basically the BC referendum, which was a disaster for us. We invested huge amounts of resources. Uh, we thought we were going to win uh, that one until the very last uh, minute, and, uh, and we lost that one too. So <laughs> kind of soured us on, on that particular approach. So yeah, uh, conflict of interest. And I think the other thing is, the other key word is process. We need to get agreement on process more than on the final product and leave the final product up to the citizens assembly. Right. Now, just the last question, Raul, before we get to, to Mark, the, the province of Ontario is the most prom populous province in Canada. You know, that's where Toronto is from and it's a center of the English language media and it's going to be the opinion leader in Canada. Um, it's having an election in June. Uh, if, what's Fair Votes Canada going to do, Fair Vote Canada, sorry, going to do in that election? Well, I think a lot of people are involved in, in that uh, election because it has a, a pos it, it could be creating a very big opportunity for proportional representation in Canada. Now, you never know until the rubber hits the road, of course, uh, but this coming election is a little bit different in one respect, which is Whereas in the past, we've always had those two dominant parties, uh, what happened in 2018, which was the last election in Ontario, is that the Liberals, who are the normal second party, right? Usually in, in Ontario, it's, it's not Labour and Conservatives as in the UK. Uh, in Canada, it tends to be more the Conservatives and the Liberals. Uh, so the Liberals have been the second party in Ontario for a very long time. But in the last election, they were massacred. They went uh, from being the government, a minority government, to uh, getting 20% of the vote, but on the basis of that 20% of the vote, being re losing their official party status. They got 5.6% of, uh, of the seats. The Liberal Democrats in the UK are, <laughs> are, know all about this kind of result, right? Um, so that kind of like, uh, throw some cold water on the liberals and get them to think about electoral reform in a way that I think they haven't done in the past. And remarkably, going into the 2022 election right now, the liberals are the party that have put electoral reform on the table. Not the NDP so far, but the liberals. So that's a, that's a big step. That's a really big step because it's a small step for the NDP to join them and say, yes, we need electoral reform. For the Greens, uh, it doesn't it goes without saying. Um, so the question is, well, okay, where are we going to go with this? If if all three parties now have an interest in electoral reform, which which they do, what can we as an advocacy organization do to help them join forces and and work together towards that? Uh, the big problem with the Liberals is that they haven't spoken so much about PR so much as just electoral reform generally, while tacking towards the alternative vote uh, approach, which of course would not give you proportional representation. So Fair Vote Canada has been uh, feeling quite threatened and, and, and upset about that. Um, and what we need to do as Fair Vote Canada is we need to help the Liberals or encourage the Liberals to pivot towards something else. And we need to encourage the NDP to actually put it on the table. The Greens, the Bulls, they'll don't go for the ride one way or another. So the question is, what do we, what should the ask be? And Parable of Canada's ask of the Liberals has been, forget it about the, the alternative vote. This is just going to be seen as a partisan measure anyway. Um, and so the general ask is of all parties to um, promise a citizens assembly if elected. And that I think has a tremendous potential because the situation right now is that you've got three major parties, the Conservatives, the Liberals, and the NDP, and then the Greens. The Greens, of course, are in favor of proportional representation, but the Conservatives would like the status quo. 
the liberals would like AV, <laughs> the NDP would like mixed member proportional, and the Greens would like any kind of proportional representation, right? So as Trudeau would put it, there is no consensus. But that doesn't mean there's not ever gonna be a consensus involving citizens. It's at the political level, it's the partisan non-consensus that exists. So if you ask instead for parties to promise a citizens assembly, then that takes the weight off the political process, hands it back to citizens, mm -hmm. and citizens have proven in the past that they can come to a consensus by taking a principles-based approach to the discussion of electoral reform rather than a partisan-based approach. It's the partisanship that creates the divisions. Well, really fascinating. As a Canadian, as a person, an electoral reformer in this country, it really spoke to, to me and I hope to the audience. Uh, over now through Steve to, to Mark to give us his, what's all this gonna mean for Canada? Uh, for, I mean, for Britain, sorry, Mark. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Al, for really fascinating um, talk about Canadian politics. And I always think, we don't pay nearly enough attention to Canadian, Australian, New Zealand politics in this country. We all, and I'm sure most people on this call won't mind me characterising all of us as, you know, we tend to like following American politics a bit too much. We love watching the West Wing. We can name often, it's not uncommon to find someone in Britain who can name more US presidents than British uh, leaders of the opposition, for example. Um, but you know, the US doesn't have a parliamentary system in the way that Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Britain does. And I think looking to those parliamentary systems is really helpful. I think I, as you were talking, I was thinking about it from a slightly different angle, which is that the route to achieving electoral reform for the House of Commons in the UK, short of armed revolution, <laughs> requires in some way a majority of MPs to vote for it, either directly or indirectly, and that therefore essentially there are three routes. There's the directly having majority of MPs voting for legislation that introduces PR. There's the referendum route, so sort of MPs outsourcing the decision somewhat, but to a referendum. Or the third route is the further outsourcing in that sense of using citizens' assembly. Um, and I think... Um, Particularly in Britain, that referendum route has in the last few years got quite a battering. I think I think uh, certainly, you know, discussions I can remember 10 or 20 years ago, the referendum idea, sorry, 15 or 20 years ago, seemed a lot more appealing as that democratic mandate. Uh, but I think what we've seen in Britain is that referendums tend to get voted on with a lot of people viewing them as, as a referendum on the government of the day. And so you get a lot of people voting on them and not, not on the issue that technically is on the ballot paper, but to express a view. And, you know, we saw that with the number of people who voted against, say, the alternative vote in 2011 because they didn't like what Nick Clegg had done. You know, I, without getting into the rights and wrongs of whether or not people should have liked Nick Clegg or not, certainly people should have been free to express dislike of him. But expressing it on a ballot paper that was technique about something else, I think, really undermined the point of that referendum. And obviously other countries with other political cultures, you don't get that problem that people do treat the referendums as their being their own thing. But I think that is a definite uh, problem in the UK. And of course, the Brexit referendum, I think, has left a lot of people even more bruised and battered about how good a democratic process the referendum really is. So I think it in that sense, I think the UK picture is much more this question of direct legislation or something like citizens assembly. And I guess the key difference between British and Canadian politics, perhaps, in this sense, is if you compare the Liberal Party in Canada with the Labour Party here, who are in a sense the roughly analogous, as in the non-conservative main party in each political system. But I, I was having a look look at election results and, you, and, and, and there's a neat symmetry if you round off the number slightly, that mm -hmm. since 1945 in Canada, the Liberals have been in power two years out of every three. So two thirds of the time, the Liberals have been the governing party in Canada. In the UK in that period of time, the Labour Party have been in power only one time in three. And so while I definitely uh, sympathise with the frustration, especially the way Trudeau made all those promises and then walked away from them, 
I think there is a difference that gives me, you know, I say this as someone who often campaigns against the Labour Party being a member of another party, but that gives me more hope for the Labour Party here than maybe the Liberals in Canada deserve, because the Liberals in Canada do basically benefit, you know, under first past the post, they've very often been in power. Here in the UK, under first past the post, Labour have very often been out of power. And coming back to Alan's point about politician self-interest, that maybe gives more reason for hope that there is a route, uh, uh, you know, the direct legislation route is a runner. Um, I think on the Citizens' Assembly, just sort of, just finally before handing back to you, Alan, I think my main, the main question I have in my mind, and be interested to see what, what, others, what others say on this, is I think asking people to sign up to a process, so asking, say, MPs to vote for a Citizens' Assembly process that they promise to implement the outcome of, in some ways, I think maybe harder if you're asking people to sign up to something where you don't know the details of what will come out the other end. There's obviously a virtue of that, which, you know, Real has very eloquently laid out, but I think there's a risk as well. And I think particularly in the aftermath of Brexit, where there was then, if you, you know, we remember all of those arguments about, well, what sort of Brexit have people really voted for? Have they voted for Brexit that involves staying in the single market or Brexit that involved leaving the single market? I do wonder, maybe even worry, um, that that Citizens' Assembly type route in the UK, in against the backdrop of what's happened here in the last few years, might actually make people feel so uneasy about, well, you know, signing up for the principle without knowing the details. We've just been through that and that hasn't been a happy prospect. So that's the question that I'm left with. But I think it's a good question to have posed because absolutely the common experience in both Canada and the UK has so far not to be successful at achieving electoral reform for the House of Commons. Uh, and therefore, it's, you know, it's important that we think through all the different routes. So thank you hugely for posing lots of questions and supplying us with lots of interesting evidence to chew over. Right. Let's go over to Steve. I'll be watching the chat box now and just sort of calling out the questions. And then Steve will sort of, if you go on too long, he'll bring out the chopper. Um, let me ask, Sean Hagen asked a question, um, which I think is quite relevant, um, which, Sean, ask your question as you asked at 7.26 p.m. Um, I'm not sure which particular question that was. Was Sorry. it the question oh. about the um, the demographic, yes. and geographical spread of support for the yes. um, Fair Votes Canada campaign in yeah, yeah. Canada, um, and and whether that is um, distributed um, in a similar way to um, experienced in the UK? Right, because I don't know what what reliable. Uh, opinion poll evidence there might be to to suggest the the actual base of support for the campaign in Canada. The reason I sort of thought that was an interesting question is that Aral and I were emailing back and forth before this call tonight. Is the support for PR more widespread in general in Canada than in the UK? And if so, why? Well, I, I can't really compare because I don't know what it's like in the, in the UK. Um, we keep hearing from our politicians that PR is not something that people raise at the door. Uh, we've heard this over and over again. So obviously, in terms of the immediate uh, appeal of issues to get votes from people, PR doesn't seem to be a real big ticket uh, winner. When you provide the slightest little bit of leadership, uh, as I have found personally, uh, people uh, find the, the idea of proportional representation extremely appealing, um, but it's just not the first issue that they, they raise at the door. The polls tend to show a majority of people supportive of the idea of proportional representation. Uh, they show its highest in Quebec, where it's been talked about for much longer than elsewhere. Uh, followed, I would say, by British Columbia, where, again, we've had three referendums in British Columbia, and that's one of the virtues of referendums, I guess, if there is one, is it does tend to educate people, and, and so they become, uh, they become more informed over time, uh, whereas in other provinces that haven't had referendums, I'd say not, knowledge about proportionality is, is much, more, uh, much more limited. Okay. 
Uh, Peter Davidson asked the question at 719 for Mark. Peter Davidson? Okay, I think I laid out the, the question in quite quite a lot of detail. Well, I mean, you, uh, you don't have to uh, all the details to, but... to provide the scenario I'm, I'm talking about. I mean, I, I've been in the democratic renewal uh, sort of community for years and years and years and years, and I, I, and over that time, I've come to the conclusion that the only credible way in which electoral reform, along with a raft of other constitutional reforms, might come to fruition is in the scenario that I describe. Now, fortunately, <laughs> at the moment, right now, if we were to have an election, that sort of outcome might might be on the cards. Um, but I realise that under first past the post, uh, a result of the, 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 the nature that I described is a bit of a, a statistical fluke. But if it did come around, did come about, what would be the Liberal Democrats position on it? Because the signing up of parties in advance is absolutely critical. And, and, and I, I heard, heard what Mark said about uh, the Brexit referendum, burning people's perceptions uh, of, of um, parties signing up in advance to things. But I'm sorry, I, I don't agree with that analysis because the one thing that was sadly lacking in the Brexit referendum was... Uh, deliberation and an informed consent process. There was there was essentially an information vacuum with Brexit, whereas uh, a citizens' assembly would proceed in the public domain. In other words, its proposals would become common knowledge. And from uh, my own experience of knowledge of uh, pilot projects that were undertaken by the Electoral Reform Society in Southampton and uh, Sheffield. Once people began to get engaged with it, boy, did they become enthused and, you know, really going for it. They understood that it could mean change and they got engaged. And if, if a, a citizens' assembly unfolded in the proper way, then yes, I do believe the UK public generally would become very, very enthusiastic about the idea because they would see it as a pathway to actual real and meaningful change. And that's something that people, one of the reasons people get turned off with politics is they say the system's rigged, first past the post being an obvious example, the system's rigged, nothing will change, they're all the same. You hear that refrain all the time. So if, if a citizens' assembly came to fruition in the manner I've described, I think it offers the most credible, credible uh, opportunity for change. But it's vital that political parties sign up in advance. In other words, we put the trust in the people, a legitimate proxy of the people, chosen at random, like a jury, and informed by expert testimony, from various various branches of civic society. Okay, thank you there, Peter. Uh, uh, Mark and Raoul. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> just so to expand a little bit on something I said earlier, I, I would be, at this moment, I think more optimistic uh, about the possibility of getting electoral reform via the combined route of, on the one hand, getting Labour to commit to support it, and secondly, uh, the potential fallback of a hung parliament ensuring there are other people, like my own party, that can then help make sure Labour keeps to that. And in a way, it might surprise you know some of you slightly to hear me talking up Labour in that respect, because obviously in the Lib Dems we've got some quite... Um, bitter experiences of, you know, from our perspective, Labour not delivering when it came, has come to the crunch on key aspects of constitutional reform in the past. But I, I do think if you look at the breadth of support in Labour for electoral reform that was evidenced in its vote at the last party conference, that although that vote wasn't successful, there was a breadth of support uh, that is quite different from what's what's been the internal Labour politics in the past. In the past, PR has essentially been something promoted by Labour modernisers. What we've seen in the last couple of years in the Labour Party is people like Momentum being extremely keen on electoral reform as well. So there's a breadth of support there. And there has been and is continuing to be a real movement amongst trade unions, 
And I think the, the, the uh, pro-electoral reformers in the Labour Party have been doing an extremely good job in the last, last couple of years. So I, I would still uh, sort of stake as my first preference, in a way, that direct route. Um, I, I think there is there is there is good grounds to believe that that is is a is a definite possibility, um, and I think if there's a hung parliament, the role that parties like my own can play in helping keep Labour to its to its you know its good intentions is is obviously crucial. Um, so I, I on on your question though, sort of specifically about citizens assembly, I, I think the key element would be that enough details of how it would work need to be fleshed out. And so that we're not in that, you know, Brexit types and scenario of, you know, people sign up to a principle and then all the argument afterwards is about, well, actually, what did that really mean? I think there's lots of different ways this assembly could be comprised, lots of different remits that it could have, etc. And, and I think a lot of those details would need working out. And I think we'd need to see that 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 first more direct route is clearly sort of running into the sand, which I guess we may see. For better or worse at the next you know the, the next autumn labor party conference um or you know what 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 plays out in that labor internal politics between now and then um but i think if that route you know does that more direct route does run into the sand and it is possible to to have a sufficiently sort of detailed plan that it's not it's not like people are signing up completely unknowing unknowing what the remit etc is going to be i think that's definitely a tool that we should should keep in mind Okay, Raoul, how are you publicizing pub citizens' assemblies in Canada, in Ontario? And how are we publicizing them? Yes, like, like, you know, it's still a pretty rare bird uh, in this uh, country. Perhaps you had a citizens' assembly on uh, climate change in the UK. Uh, is in Scotland, they're having citizens' assemblies constitutional on constitutional issues. There's been citizens' assemblies in Ireland. So uh, we often refer to those ourselves. Um, Fairbolt Canada has a website on citizens' assemblies. Uh, we're using that. Um, we're using uh, uh, social media, of course. Uh, we had a big door hanger campaign in the federal election. Uh, we dropped off about 300,000 door hangers across the country. Um, and I think that raised quite a bit uh, of interesting uh, reaction uh, from people. I want to make a comment on what Mark's been saying about the, the direct route. Uh, because, Mark, what you're talking about is precisely the approach that we use in Canada for 100 years. And the thing that happens is even those parties that promise electoral reform when they're in opposition, Labour in your case, once they're elected, they lose their caucus. If any MP will look at his or her chances of re-election, if you change the electoral system, and a lot of them will conclude well, no, I would probably lose my seat if you change the system on me. So you lose part of your caucus. Once you've lost part of your caucus, you lose the rest of your caucus because they're their friends, right? Um, so it's a very, it's, it's much iffier than, than I think you, uh, you realize, Mark. Uh, I would say if you think you've got the caucus to go the direct route, then you've got the caucus to go for a citizen's assembly to back yourselves up. And the leader will be in a much safer position calling for a citizen's assembly than calling for the direct route. Because nobody can, can say, no, we can't have a citizens assembly. That's, that's anti-democratic. Uh, but they can certainly uh, sit on their uh, heels with regards to uh, the direct route, wait until the last minute, call a referendum that they know will fail. Uh, I hate to be pessimistic, but our experience uh, calls for pessimism. Can I, Alan, do you mind if I ask Rial just a follow up question on that? Of course not. Because um, because I guess one of the potential risks with a citizens assembly is that some people see it as a way of basically kicking the issue into the long grass. You know, the the the, the cliche is that if you don't want to deal with an issue, you set up a, a royal commission or similar <laughs> to look at it. So there's a risk that that becomes a we'll kick it into the long grass and then, oh, there's some other issue that suddenly becomes really important and you never quite. What's the route by which you're sort of hoping, intending to avoid that sort of trap? Well, if we take the uh, the Ontario case, mm. what, you know, in the upcoming election in June, uh, in terms of what I would hope for is that you would get the three opposition parties agreeing in advance to hold a citizen's assembly, uh, to convene a citizen's assembly within six months of taking power and commit, 
In a, I mean, it's going to have to remain a little bit ambiguous because the responsibility does lie with the elected officials after all, but to commit in, in some way to following up on those uh, on the recommendations of the Citizens Assembly in time for the following election. So that's the commitment that you have to make. You can, after the election takes place, you can sit down and discuss what the mandate should look like, what the resources should like, look like, what the role of experts should be, what sort of dialogue there should be between politicians and the members of the assembly. And I mean, there's some safety measures that politicians can take to make sure that you know <laughs> uh, this thing doesn't get away on them entirely, uh, but that makes it easier for them to keep their promise in the end. So that, that's uh, kind of how I see it. Um, it it does kick things into the long grass if you like, but if you do it like the French did with their citizens assembly on climate change, uh, it allows politicians to take on uh, policy commitments that they otherwise might not be able to do. It, it helps them to do hard things. That's how Ireland got the, uh, the uh, reform legislation on abortion. Politicians were unable to do it, but going through a citizens assembly allowed them to do it. I'll just jump in here. It's a person monitoring the chat box here. There's many interesting points being made, but there are not too many questions. It's for people giving sort of their opinions. We do so really like some more questions. And Alan, I Justin, uh, can, oh. can we, uh, I think we've, I've spotted a couple of hands. Uh, Justin has been waiting very, very patiently to throw his a question. Right, perfect. Hi, thanks. Um, I've just got a quick question for Royal, and then maybe one for Mark. It's got time. Um, uh, following on from what you said, Alan, about raising public awareness about citizens' assemblies, um, I saw the mention of um, the citizens' assemblies on climate change and the Scottish um, situation in the UK. But personally, I'm not actually, I got almost no awareness of those citizens' assemblies, where I think the only one I'm actually aware of, and I'm consider myself quite politically engaged is the Irish abortion citizens assembly which was followed by a referendum I suppose my question is how for it to work I think you would have to have a high level of public awareness which probably means a lot of engagement with national with broadcasters which in the UK probably means BBC and ITV and you'd need coverage in the newspapers and other online or else people just wouldn't understand because as i say i am not getting any feedback from the systems i have no awareness of the systems assemblies about climate change which i'm very interested in or the scottish one so that was my first question uh my question for mark was um it was just really i think you mentioned that about referendums um and about Personally, I'm not keen on referendums and there's all sorts of problems. I would imagine, I'm interested in knowing what the Lib Dem position, if there is a position of the party or the MPs in particular on whether, well, if they have a position on whether you need a referendum or whether they'd negotiate hard in, in a hung parliament situation to avoid a referendum or if they think it's inevitable or if they, maybe they haven't come to a position but anyway what what the position is so shall i start with the first question yeah sure sure All right so your question justin is about how you raise uh public awareness uh i i I'm not a, a master of communications myself, but I will say that it has been done. Um, in the case of uh, the French Citizens Assembly on climate change, it was highly publicized. And I think the, the, the public, uh, the, the government has an important role to play in making sure it gets out there. Uh, that was one of the problems in the, on, after the Ontario Citizens Assembly, the government made no effort whatsoever to disseminate the results of the Citizens Assembly. So you need that, that's one of the roles of government is to make sure that it gets out. Um, you mentioned that you knew quite a bit about the, the Irish one. Um, that one, I think, also was highly publicized. And another example of pretty good public uh, publicized publicity was in the case of the British Columbia one in 2005. A lot of people knew about that. And it was part of the mandate of the Citizens Assembly to get out there. Individual members of the Citizens Assembly would drum up 
uh, discussion and conversation within their own communities and they would reach out to the media. It was kind of like one of the responsibilities of every Citizens Assembly member was to publicize the work that they'd been doing. So that, that aspect of it is, is extremely important. There has to be public consultations as well. It's not just 100 people sitting in a room uh, talking to themselves. They have to discuss with experts and they have to reach out to the general public as well. Mark? And on um, your question about whether or not a referendum is required, Justin, I think there definitely needs to be some sort of democratic mandate, um, but a referendum is not the only way of having that. I know there can be a referendum, there can be a democratically made decision for a citizens assembly as Rial has, has, has laid out, um, or indeed I think if you see parties commit to electoral reform in their manifestos ahead of an election, if under first past the post that then delivers a majority either for one of those parties or combined you know, for, for several of them, that is similarly that's what counts as a democratic mandate under our under our current system. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, OK, we have to play by the rules of the current system. Uh, uh, but therefore, that also means that if there's a, you know, if a majority of MPs come from one or more parties who are committed to electoral reform in their manifesto, that counts as a mandate under the current system. And that's 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 good grounds, therefore, for, for changing it. And that's why I think um, I don't yet, as it were, give up hope <laughs> on the, you know, the campaigners for, for electoral reform in the Labour Party winning that, because I think if Labour commit to electoral reform, in a manifesto ahead of a general election, that would be quite a significant move and indeed would be a step up from actually what they, they said ahead of, for example, the 97 election. So um, Real is right that even if there is a stronger commitment in advance, <laughs> that, that commitment may still turn, turn, turn to ashes, but I think that's why there is hope for that route as well. Okay, well, we move to Gisela, our Canadian friend here. Your question about constitutional barrier to electoral reform in Canada. And then Alan Yearsley has a question as well. That's to me, I guess. Um, no, as far as I know there, and as far as uh, constitutional experts in Canada have said, there, there is no constitutional barrier. You can change the electoral system. It would be a change to the um, Elections Act. There is, however, and I think it's important to mention this, there is a charter challenge in Canada that's going on as to whether the current system, first past the post, is constitutional uh, because it does not lead to an equally effective vote for all citizens. Um, and a lot of citizens feel their vote is completely worthless. Um, so that's the challenge that's uh, being put forward now and uh, it's going to the Ontario court. First, then eventually we'll make it, uh, may make it to all the way to the Supreme Court. Okay, well, we had this fun question here from, uh, now, Rosemary, about Marcus Rashford. Go for it, Mar Rosemary. Um, my question was, why, why instead of a citizen, if we have to have a, a public campaign to educate people about citizens' assemblies, why don't we have a public campaign to educate people about PR and the need for PR? At the moment, we have a diabolical government elected by 19% of the electorate, and people just aren't aware of this. Can, can I just jump in first and answer that? Rosemary, Get PR Done is almost 24-7 advertising about the benefits of PR and what's the matter with First Past the Post. Uh, there is a lot of work going on. Uh, it'd be lovely to have Marcus Rashford on side, but don't think that there's nothing going on out there. Just, you know, you see the amount of stuff that Matt and, and, and Barry is churning stuff out all the time, blogs. There is a lot of publicity for PR out there. But it's, uh, it's not, it reaches people interested in, in the election, electoral system like me. I'm on email lists, but it doesn't reach the general public. That's the problem. Okay, well, go for it, Raoul and Mark. Well, all I will say is I, people have their own lives. They've got kids, they've got sports. Uh, not everybody is prepared to invest what it takes to understand what's wrong with our electoral system. And you can't force feed 
that kind of uh, understanding. So I, I think there are limits to how much you can actually educate the public. Um, I think if you had a citizens assembly, reaching out to the public should be part of their mandate. Um, and that, that might have more a better reception than when it's just advocacy organizations like Fair Vote Canada that, that do that kind of work. Thank you. Mark, do you have anything to say on that? Um, I, well, I, I guess one thing to add to that is I think it's always harder to get the public interested in, in a policy that's about a process rather than an outcome. Yeah. And, you know, electoral reform is about how we better select our politicians and hold them to account as opposed to changing the thing that then happens and now we know that it has an impact but we but we know the process matters for the outcome but it's always harder to get people interested in the in the yeah. process type things than the outcome type things it's why for example people are get very passionate about for example their experience in the a e service in the nhs and tend not to get particularly passionate about what are the regional boundaries that should be used for NHS administration. Although those are really important for influencing the other one, it's a process thing. So I think that is always going to be, you know, is always going to be a struggle. And that's, I think, perhaps, you know, it is a different angle on why winning uh, PR in a referendum is, is quite a tough thing, because the temptation is for people to think about the government, the incumbents and vote on the Vote, vote vote on that and feel like they're voting on an outcome thing rather than the process thing. Anna Beria, why don't you ask your question of pessimism that you asked at 804? We can't hear you. Anna Beria? Yes, my, my, my audio is very poor. Can you read it for me? I will. Well, I'll <coughs> sorry. It's not really a question, but it's a, a voice of pessimism. I don't think that a significant majority of the public considers the issue of electoral reform that important. Child hunger is very real, and the argument is intervention very hard to counter. I don't see the public would embrace a call for, for electoral reform, no matter how popular the proposer, whether we had Marcus Rashford and Gary Lineker and who knows else on side for PR, you just don't think it can happen. Okay, uh, Mark or Rail. Um, shall I shall I go yeah. first on this one? Um, I mean, I think in a weird way, the events of the last couple of months have been quite helpful. I mean, there's an awful lot you know, the substance of what the government has done and Boris Johnson did with going to parties and all of that is appalling and wrong. There is a small silver lining in that, in that I think it makes the case for saying, you know, we need to clean up our politics and change the way politics is done. It does make that a bit easier. I think it's still a hard case to make for the sorts of reasons we've sort of been discussing earlier on this call, but I think it does make it easier, even if I wouldn't go as far as saying easy. Um, and in that sense, I would be a bit more optimistic uh, than yourself, Anna, but we do need to be realistic about how hard it is to keep the public's attention uh, on such issues. And I guess this comes back therefore to the point uh, about whether to go for the direct route and therefore in a way only having to get the public and politicians interest for a short period of time to get legislation through, or to go for the more indirect route, which risks the focus being lost, but obviously has the advantages that Raoul has laid out. On the other hand, it's it's quite a interesting conundrum as to the pros and cons of each of those routes, I think. One of the things that I found when we did our door hanger in uh, this year, and so I was going door to door quite a bit, uh, and I found really interesting, um, a lot of people were a little bit resistant to the idea of proportional representation for one or uh, one reason or another. Sometimes it seemed like a fairly partisan uh, response that I was getting from people, right? Uh, the, the people who voted liberal, for example, would tend to be resistant because they know that liberals have been criticized on that uh, in Canada. Uh, but what was really interesting to me is how quickly they caught on to the idea of a citizens assembly. And I think the reason is a lot of people don't get excited about proportional representation because they've given hope 
they, they don't expect that it's ever going to happen. Uh, and so they stop thinking about it. So as soon as you, but as soon as you tell them about this idea, look, you know, if we can sell the process, this is very interesting what you were saying about process, Mark. Uh, I think this is a case where process actually may sell better than the pudding. Uh, that certainly was my experience. As soon as you started talking about a citizen's assembly, people would be like, oh yeah, that's cool. I like that. And then they start talking to me, right? So yeah, so sometimes process matters too. Um, just to come in on an admin front, uh, Alan, we've got about, uh, 15 minutes tops right. before a, a wind up. I noticed that we've got questions in from Peter and Eileen. It'd be great if we could leave a couple of minutes for Mark and Real uh, to sum up at the end. Sure, sure. Uh, I, Peter had a bit of a chance to speak. I, I, does somebody else have their hand up? I can't actually see your hand. Uh, Eileen? I, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I just uh, was going to say they did persuade people in New Zealand. So how did they do that? Do we know? <laughs> Sorry, can you ex explain that question a little bit more? Well, it's just that the, the campaign was successful in New Zealand. So I'm wondering whether there's a succinct analysis of why it worked there and it hasn't worked in Canada and it hasn't worked here yet in the UK. What was different in, the New, in New Zealand to make it work? Well, it different. Mark, yeah. This is something I had actually prepared a couple of talking points on. Uh, what happened in New Zealand was a very special situation where people were really royally pissed off at both of the major parties and uh, voting for a, a, a voting system that would give them more choice uh, was very popular. So I think it was a rather exceptional situation. Um, often in Canada, where we've had referendums, things were horrendous a couple of elections back. But by the time you have the referendum, things are kind of not so bad anymore. And so the, the urgency of, of change is not felt in the same way as it was felt in, uh, in New Zealand. I would say New Zealand is a rather exceptional uh, case in that regard. Yeah, I think when, when the referendums first happened in New Zealand, I think a lot of people look to that as oh here's a possible role model but I think as the years have gone by it's increasingly clear that it was a really weird circum set of circumstances and every time I read about it I sort of have to pinch myself and sort of reread and think that how, how did that really happen how did you have a political system in which both the main parties are opposed to electoral reform stumbling into the main parties legislating for a referendum to introduce something that they were they were against it's a really <laughs> strange set of tactical political miscalculations that in a way you know citizens of new zealand and us as fellow 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 humans should be grateful for you know but but it's it's i mean it, you know it's just it would if you were doing a TV drama about politics, I don't think you would dare quite have such a self-defeating bit of tactical ineptness where people end up getting committed to introducing something they're actually against. But also it, it required that weirdness because yeah, the, all, the, all the main politicians were against. And it was because all the main politicians were against, that, as Rial says, that therefore the vote could be seen as about a sort of an anti-politics vote as opposed to to characterise it very crudely, say the AV referendum in 2011 in the UK being an anti-Nick Clegg vote or a, you know anti-David Cameron vote. And, and so I think it required that really weird combination of circumstances to work. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's only one other country that in the modern era has introduced electoral reform via referendum. Um, so it is, yeah, I, I, although it has a sort of a really strong textbook type appeal, well, of course, the people as a whole should get to vote to choose what their electoral system is. I think in, in practice, um, maybe, I, maybe I'm just following the natural arc of getting more cynical as you get older, but I think referendums for, for choosing electoral systems seem to be particularly problematic. Though, if that's the only option, if it's that or nothing, then certainly I will go full tilt for making the most of it. But I think as we've been sketching out, there are other routes that may well be, be, be better and, you know, democratically just as, if not more justifiable than a referendum. Richard, ask your question about the Tories in PR. Ask it as a question. NATO 6. Richard Toller. Richard Toller, handy? Yeah, well, I'm an ex-Tory myself, and, um, uh, but I'm... Uh, really fed up with them but um i know i just think that they uh 
because actually the, the, there was a, a conservative full PR after the 74 election, mm. was it, or something like that, I think, when they actually suffered. Um, I can't think what year it was. But no, no, no it was it's slightly ironic. I'm just saying that I think uh, the way things are going, they're going to do so bad in the next election that they'll be crying out for PR. Um, and, and I think actually, in a, in a funny kind of way, um, that's the kind of argument that, that one should put is that, you know, I mean, I really disagree with everything they say at the moment, but um, the, you know, every party of right or left has a has a uh, a right to be um, represented in some way, you know, because PR will inevitably lead to coalitions and it probably will lead to the Conservative Party breaking into parts. It probably leads to the Labour Party breaking into parts. And I think um uh, that that would be, that's a very good thing and i think alan you uh, you've got the thing coming up soon about the um finnish um yes. experience with pr you know all, all that i think is, is something that we should put forward that that it's like a sort of um about what what pr and coalitions is like everyone having their finger on the ouija board as you might say uh spelling out the right message anyway that's not really a question but it, i would invite comments on that Right. Um, I, I will just jump in on that, that on uh, March the 15th, put it in your calendar, we're going to have a session about, in particular, what the left can learn from PR. In, in Finland, uh, it is really quite wonderful. I have a five-party coalition of Greens and Centrals and, and lefties who are running the government. All five parties, uh, incidentally, all led by women, four of the five were uh, elected to that position when they were um, less than uh, 35 years of age. And what happened was that in case of the left alliance, which is one of the parties in the coalition, they got 8% of the vote in the 2019 election, which meant then they got 8% of the seats in the Finnish legislature, Finnish parliament. So they've got 16 uh, MPs from the left alliance. Uh, this is the kind of party that could grow in this country, you know, perhaps headed by Clive Lewis and, and Zara Sultana, a left party, uh, uh, unlike the Labour Party, which would in fact actually um, have a, a shot of having some influence in parliament. Uh, I see it is 8.20. Maybe we should sort of wrap up here. Um, I noticed that uh, Jake had his hand up momentarily. I don't know if there's a question there. Sorry. Uh, Embar uh, embarrassingly, no, I just accidentally clicked on it. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> right. Uh, and the yeah, other one. We have a very interesting situation in Canada with regards to the Conservatives, if I may be allowed just a, a quick comment on that. Um, what we have in Canada as a tendency is that you've got vote splitting from the center and the center left, and then the conservatives tend to be united. That's been kind of the rule, and that's what allows them to form government, usually false majority governments with you know 40% of the vote or something like that. But the, it, this is no longer working for the conservatives federally, and I expect maybe in some provincial levels that's it's also going to stop working, simply because they've got too much in that one big tent. Um, the challenge for them, it would be to break up, uh, they would be more effective broken up, but then they'd have to have proportional representation. So uh, they, they've got uh, they've got a long way to go, I think, uh, in order to get their house in order. Right. Well, why don't you just sort of make your final comments, uh, Raoul, if you have any, uh, just about th this uh, session tonight and what you've learned or what anything you want to add. Well, I, I've had a lot of chance to talk, <laughs> so I, I don't have a lot to add, except I really do think that uh, when it comes, if we are ever going to make progress on uh, getting electoral reform, uh, it's going to take some agreement on a process that's different than just enacting, you know, uh, the direct route, as, as Mark puts it, it, it's going to take more than that. Uh, and as I pointed out, uh, if you've got the votes to go the direct route, you've got the votes to go the Citizens Assembly route as well and make your uh, contribution more lasting than it otherwise might be and more sure. Right. Mark? Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Rial. It's been really interesting hearing firsthand from the coalface of 
electoral reform campaigning in Canada. And I think this question about which is the best tactic is one that it's always important to keep under review because the answer is quite context dependent. And what whatever we might think is the right answer now may look rather different in a year's time or two years time. So it's really it's been really I found it really helpful to hear, you know, direct from you um, the sort of the the pros and the cons of different routes that have been taken uh, in Canada. And I, I thought just partly coming back to um, one of the comments made earlier, it's worth sort of ending on a perhaps particular note of optimism about electoral reform in the UK in that, you know, we have now very well established PR systems in Northern Ireland for the Welsh Senate, uh, for the Scottish Parliament and for Scottish local government, mm -hmm. as well as for the London Assembly. And although, you know, the, our current government is talking about um, removing the supplementary vote system for elected mayors, interestingly, even the current Conservative government is not wanting to remove any of those other forms of electoral reform. And perhaps it's not a complete coincidence that those are ones under which unpopular Conservative parties in Wales and Scotland have managed to get some politicians elected <laughs> at times. Uh, but, you know, it, it, there is there is an a, a important degree to which uh, proportional representation electoral systems of different sorts have actually put down quite deep roots in this country. So I think that gives us a reason for optimism about what can be achieved in the future. The question, of course, is whether it is undue optimism to try to go for the direct route or wise battle hardened uh, realism to go for the citizens assembly route. But whichever route, you know, we end up we end up trying to push the most. Undoubtedly, those choices will be much better informed by the sorts of discussions we've had this evening. So thank you hugely to um, get PR done for, for putting on this event, inviting me to it and for Al for sharing your time with us. I found it fascinating. I'm sure everyone else has as well. Right. Okay, thanks folks. Steve, over to you for the final word. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Alan, uh, for uh, putting on such a fantastic session. Can we thank uh, everybody here for turning up, posing excellent questions. Uh, people who have come from a Compass session and have had an absolute marathon of, of, a, of a virtual evening. Uh, thank you so much.